Uh, congratulations on the success of Resident Alien. Um, and uh, I hope the the TV show, even though it hasn't really been faithful, uh, is doing is doing well. Um, do you wish it had been more faithful, or is that not even something well, you think about? No, it's 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 something I get asked a lot. Um, my feeling really is um, it's kind of uh, if they'd done a really faithful show, but it was kind of low budget and dull, uh, that would have been awful. You know, the fact that they've done something that is being enjoyed by millions of people and it's actually good. Um, and you know my friends watch it and like it you know all of that um is it's absolutely fine with me i'd far rather we had that than the dull version welcome back to the comics cube everyone today i'm joined by peter hogan how are you i'm good good to see you Good to see you too. I have one question that I ask everyone who comes on the show for the first time, and it's why do you love comics? Why do I love comics? I fell in love with them when I was about five or six. Um, I mean, I basically learned to read on Batman and Superman. Um, I don't know this. I just think there's something, you know, um, immediately engaging about that combination of words and pictures. Were and, you a, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, go on. Were you a DC guy growing up? I was a DC guy um, growing up because that's pretty much all there was. I discovered Marvel um, a couple of years in. It would have been about 1963 and was hooked on Marvel for, um, you know, till I reached my teens anyway. So, What was that like uh, getting right there in the Marvel age? It was um, it was very exciting. I think the thing was, you know, I've been reading DC for a couple of years, so you kind of knew what the rules were. You knew what Superman's backstory was and Batman's backstory. And then all of a sudden you're presented with the Fantastic Four and it's like, what the hell is going on? I don't I don't know anything about these people. So that aspect of it was very exciting. Why are they why are they all fighting? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um also, um when did you realize that you might want to make comics? Uh, I don't really know. I mean, it, it, I kind of drifted into um, uh, I was I was a journalist around about the time of the big sort of Dark Knight Watchmen era. So uh, the magazines I was working for said, you know about this stuff, go off and interview these guys. So I went off and, you know, interviewed Alan Moore and the Hernandez brothers and all kinds of people. And as a result of that, I ended up um, getting a job editing comics. And so I got to know pretty much everybody on the British comics scene. And when that job came to an end, um, loads of people have been saying why don't you have a go at this so you know for lack of anything else to do i did so when you were a kid you didn't you didn't think of uh making your own or not really I don't think I had interesting the i don't think i had the confidence i mean no um i'm not sure i even realized that they were put together by human beings i thought they just kind of appeared you know magically until, yeah, until Stan made Stan Lee made a point of making sure that you knew who everybody's names were, you know. Yeah, yeah. DC uh, was just, you know. Yeah, DC wasn't big on credits, were they? No. No, no, not at all. Not at all. Were you following local British comics as well? Yeah, but British comics were, with very few exceptions, they were mainly kind of aimed at younger kids, or they were just straight up humorous stuff. Um, there was one comic called Valiant, which was kind of um, more action oriented and uh, and pretty much everybody read that. And that was things like the Steel Claw and Kelly's Eye and, you know, various yeah. other things, which have been revived in recent years. In fact, I wrote one Steel Claw story myself. That was one of the first things I did. Which uh, creators, you know, growing up or later on, maybe like really made an impression on you? 
I think Ditko, because he was so different from everybody else. Um, and Steve Gerber, uh, as a writer, again, was just different from everybody else. And there were, um, I'm sure, loads more, but I, I can't think of them offhand. I drifted away from comics for a long time. And then, um, you know, shortly before that kind of comics boom that I mentioned earlier, I, I kind of drifted back again and read everything that Frank Miller had done and John Byrne had done and so on and so on. Yeah. But it was I, obvious that, you know, Alan Moore was head and shoulders above everybody else that was doing anything. You know, there was just 10 times the imagination. I figured that name would come up during this conversation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is, <laughs> it always does. Is it, is, who would you say uh, has more imagination Per square inch of their body, Alan Moore or Jack Kirby? Oh, no, that's a hard one. Um, I mean, the thing about Jack is it, it's this kind of fantastic non-stop fountain of ideas. And Alan's a bit the same way. But with Jack, it's just, um, I don't know, it just takes your breath away. But Jack wasn't a writer. He was a storyteller, but he wasn't a writer. Um, and that shows um whereas with alan alan's one of those writers who, who started out as as an artist or trying to be an artist so i think he had that kind of um advantage that a lot of writers don't so that's interesting because i think uh, i love them both i love yeah. them both i mean i really wish i'd met jack kirby that is interesting because i think that um a lot of the discourse amongst comics fans and comics journalists is like the distinction between art and writing. And I tend to think that there is a very massive overlap between the two when it comes to comics, because so much of the storytelling yeah. is done visually. So when you say that he's not a writer, he's a storyteller, but not a writer, where does the yeah. distinction fall for you? Well, I think, I mean, if you look at, you know, some of Jack's artwork, you can see he's kind of scribbled his, uh, you know, rough dialogue or his suggestions for dialogue, in, you know, around the edges of the artwork. Um, and it's great, but it's not, uh, you know, I mean, what, what Stan Lee did was to give it a polish and to sort of, you know, pick up the ball and run with it. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, uh, Kirby's DC work, fourth, the whole fourth world thing is fantastic, but it's not as well written as the stuff he was doing for Marvel. Um, but the ideas are all there, you know? Yeah. I, I feel like the fourth world stuff also could have used an editor. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's the it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, but but still, we love it, and there's so many good bits of it. You know, I mean, things that you know, I I don't think anybody's come up with that kind of non-stop stream of ideas that that Kirby had. Kirby could have gone on, you know, coming up with stuff till the end of time. You know, you just know it. He had all these things up his sleeve. One of the one of the criticisms that gets you know le levied against against alan moore is that a lot of his ideas are repurposed from or re from you know previously existing ideas what's your take on on that particular stance i think it's uh it depends what you're talking about uh i mean i think you know um I think we're all influenced, not just by comics, but, you know, by movies, by books, by, you know, whatever comes to hand. So the odds are whatever idea you're dealing with, somebody somewhere has done it in a different way before you turned up to, you know, have a look at things. Um, also, I think with if you're talking about the superhero stuff, um, you know, Watchmen kind of is the Charlton characters, you know, then there's no denying it. But what Alan did with that was to take it into a whole other dimension. And I think the same's true for, you know, a lot of the stuff he did. It's one of the danger, it's one of the problems with superheroes is that um, you know, the the big two are just kind of like recycling the same ideas forever. Um, and it gets it's a law of diminishing returns, you know. Um, and I think if you if you try to do new superhero stuff, um, that can be really good and really interesting. I mean, you look at Astro City and what Kurt Bazik did there is, is, you know, he created his own new world. Um, 
But if you look at a lot of those characters, you know, it's hard not to say, well, you know, this one's a bit like Superman or this one's a bit like Batman, you know. So you've got that kind of history behind you. There's no getting away from it. Yeah. I think, you know, the. It's like superheroes dominate comics and they pay the rent. So you can kind of understand why. But the more stuff that can be done that isn't superheroes, the more the medium will grow. Um, but that means shops giving giving up shelf space to it, which they're reluctant to do because people come in to buy superhero comics. So it's all a bit of a vicious circle. If shelf space is the issue, do you think digital is a solution to that kind of diversity issue? Digital? Yeah, I think... Well, I think one of the things about the internet is it's... Um, it's a bit like the 1960s. You discover stuff by word of mouth. You know, people will go, have you seen this movie? Have you heard this band? You know, whatever. Um, and the internet's a bit like that. So as long as people are doing the word of mouth thing to say, hey, I discovered this great comic that you can only get online, uh, then maybe that's the direction that will prosper. You mentioned before that before you're working in comics, you were a journalist and um, you were, in fact, a, a, a rock music journalist. In fact, you were asked yeah, yeah, personally time. by Pete Townsend to run a to run a bookshop. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's true. I think, well, I knew Pete and I was probably the only bookseller that he knew and he wanted to open a bookshop so uh, that's that's how i got the gig <laughs> i love how casual that is I, I knew pete townsend yeah well we um uh, we sort of moved in the same social circles for a while and um we had a lot in common and we got on well so that's awesome that's, that's pretty that's yeah. pretty cool i'm a, I'm a huge uh, fan of rock music so uh yeah. what was it like so i guess i'm fascinated by this what was it like reading Marvel Comics at the dawn of Marvel Comics at the same time yeah. that the Beatles were coming up? Yeah, it was great. I mean, the thing about the 1960s was it was great. There's no denying it. And all those records, all those comics, all those movies and cool TV shows and all the rest of it. But, the, you know, the thing is, they were all spaced out. You know, it didn't happen all at once. So each week you might get one good comic, one good TV show, one good record. And then you'd have to wait to the next week for, you know, something else to happen. And TV, you know, I mean, when I was growing up, there were two channels. And then in the 1960s, they started a third one. So it was, so you had choice, but really not that much choice compared to now. How would you say working in something like music journalism differs from working in the comic book industry? Well, it depends what you're doing in the comic book industry, but music journalism, you are, um, well, if you're interviewing people, you've got to have, you'd be intelligent enough to, you know, get an intelligent conversation out of somebody, uh, which means doing your research and all of that. And if you're reviewing stuff, really, that's just your opinion. I mean, hopefully an informed opinion, um, but really... I think it's very, very different from doing what I do now, because I think, uh, you know, while the world needs historians and critics and all the rest of it, it's not the same thing as doing something creative. That's a, a different brain, you know. I mean, when, for a while I was doing, still doing journalism at the same time as I was writing comics, and I could never do it on the same day, you know, because the, the change of mindset is just too great. Okay. Can you tell? Can you talk quickly about how you got back into comics? You mentioned that you uh, started interviewing comic book uh, creators. Like, what was it? Yeah, yeah. What was it that like got you really back into it? Really? Well, I kind of, you know, I I still read um, throughout the sort of seventies. Um, I read the X Men because everybody read the X Men, but that was about it. And then I started to notice a couple of other things. How Chaikin's American Flag I got into quite early on. 
and um, and then discovered Alan Moore with Warrior. And at that point, it was like sort of, oh, you can do this with comics. You can do this with superheroes. This is interesting. And I think that's what drew in a lot of people. You know, I mean, you know, Neil Gaiman had the same experience. You know, you just stum stumbled across this thing. It's like, oh, we've changed gear. Everything's going, you know, much more interestingly now. Yeah, Neil Gaiman points to Swamp Thing, I believe. As, uh, yeah, but Neil Neil also discovered, you know, Warrior very early on, if not on day one. Yeah. We all did, you know, because you just saw this thing on the racks and went, what the hell is this? So, you know. Alan did do a couple of things for Warrior. So did you have a favorite between Marvel Man and V? Uh... Or was it more, was it more, this is from the same guy? Yeah, well, there was a bit of that. But Marvel Man definitely because um, they kind of enticed it on the cover. They did this sort of you know, ooh, what which ancient hero are we reviving? And I vaguely remembered Marvel Man, so I thought, yeah, I'll give this a go. Um, so that's what drew me in. And then it wasn't just V. Um, I can't remember how many issues into Warrior it happened, but they did um, uh, the Bo Jeffrey saga, oh, which yeah. I just thought was genius, you know. And that's that's how I discovered Steve Parkhouse, and uh, who would loom large in my future, though I didn't know it. You had no idea of knowing. No. <laughs> the the Bo Jeffries is the one Alan Moore thing that I think eludes me. Like I don't think I get it. Well, Maybe I'm really, not British it, enough. Yeah, it's it's kind of peculiar in some ways, but it's basically it's his him doing the Adams family, but in this kind of very strange, you know middle england kind of way can you can you talk about uh the first job that you did uh for comics which i believe has uh is editing revolver for fleetway uh yeah well it was um i'd done sort of odd things before them but that, that don't really count but the first thing that happened was um um Fleetway asked me to come in and, and help out part time on, on an editorial basis on a, a magazine called Crisis, which was, you know, part of the 2000 AD group. And it was uh, supposedly a bit more adult and a bit more political. And the editor really needed a vacation. So I was asked if I could go in and kind of, you know, just babysit the thing for a few weeks while, you know, he went and had a holiday. And um uh, so I did that, and when he got back, they asked me to stay on. So I was assistant editor on that for six months or so, and then they asked me to set up something new, and that turned into being Revolver. And uh, how did you... And then you started writing for 2080. How did that end up going? Well, what... <laughs> uh, that was after I left. Uh, I mean, Revolver lasted, you know half a dozen issues and a couple of specials and then they shut it down um so when that happened i thought i'd decide to try giving writing a go and 2000 ad was the obvious place because that's kind of where everybody starts in britain and um, so i started the same way everybody does with doing some short short stories and uh, then they gave me a series and then they gave me some of their established characters to play with and I did all that for a couple of years. And by that point, um, Vertigo had noticed me and um, uh, Elisa Quitney rang me up and they were just about to launch the Dreaming and Looking for Writers. And for me, that was kind of, you know, uh, ideal. You know, I mean, who wouldn't want to play with the Sandman characters? So I did that. And then they asked me, who did I want to draw it? And I said, Steve Parkhouse. <laughs> and, and that's how we kind of started as a team. How did you take to to doing the dreaming? Like, was there, did you feel, obviously you felt a great opportunity to play with the Sandman characters. It's such a rich sure. universe. But did you feel any pressure in following Neil? Yeah, well, he's a hard act to follow, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Um, and that's, um, and I love Sandman. I thought it was, a, you know, a wonderfully rich world. So, um so however nervous I was, you know, the the opportunity to um, play in that, you know, if you if you pardon the expression, sandbox, I mean, that was just too, too good to waste, you know. Yeah. Uh, of course I had to step up and have a go. 
Did you have a, uh, was it challenging knowing that, you know, the main character of uh, was dead? <laughs> well, the thing was, there were a lot of characters in Sandman and they're all a part of the story. Um, I actually did get to use Morpheus in, um, in Love Street, Sandman presents Love Street, mm -hmm. though he has a kind of, he has a silent part, so... Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I think basically Neil didn't want um, other people messing around with his baby in that sense. But he was interested to see what people could produce with, you know, the minor characters. With everyone else, yeah. yeah. Did you think there was a particular Sandman character that could have potentially carried their own series? Well, they did with Lucifer. Um, but yeah. that was the only one. I'm, I'm not so sure. I mean, one of the things that when they, they were doing the dreaming, I think they were thinking about, you know, um, as a model, I think they were thinking about Legends of the Dark Knight. And the idea with that was, mm. you know, everybody's got a Batman story in them. Um, so that worked fine. But when it came to the Sandman, not everybody has got a Sandman story in them. And it's quite a difficult thing to do. So it was very much a <clears throat> kind of hit and miss thing. And that's why in the end, they boiled it down to two writers that uh, Neil was having, was happy with, you know, his yeah. world. You know. Yeah, I was wondering yeah. about that because the tone of the book had completely changed by the end of the series. It, yeah. Yeah. Well, basically it came down to me and Caitlin Kiernan and we kind of alternated a bit. Um, Caitlin had the advantage that she kind of had a following. She had a readership. And so she brought that with her. Um, and she ended up taking over, um, which I can't say I was happy with. But, you know, that's life. You move on. Um, it's the job. But, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> these days, my only feelings about the whole thing really are that I'd love to see DC collect all my Sandman stories in a book and I've you know I really wish that would happen but they don't seem inclined to do so so there you go why do you think that is like I, I feel like they have such a wide variety of material and especially with something like you know the Sandman show out you'd think they would be packaging everything you'd think, yeah. I mean I think the well, the short answer is I don't think they know what they're doing um, or they're not allowed to do more um, because yeah you, you know they've got a, this this vast back library of things they could do stuff with and um, um, but you know um, I don't know they don't even read their emails so how the hell they can <laughs> <laughs> expect to I be feel like there's a story there that I should ask about well it's just simply um, you know, there have been occasions when I've been going, hi, you know, and nobody answers, you know, and you oh, think, wow. um, you know, it's, it's a shame because, you know, um, I mean, you can't go back in life. I mean, I, you know, I probably could do more Sandman stories if anybody wanted me to, but, um, you know, but nonetheless, you know, I, I, I'm proud of what I did. I'd like to see, you know, I mean, you, I think you can still get it digitally, but it would be nice to see it on the bookshelves again. What's your approach to writing? Like, how do you tackle a character or tackle a specific uh, storyline or theme? Well, I think with if you're writing other people's characters, it's kind of easier. I mean, you know, I wrote Sandman characters. I wrote um, a lot of um, Alan Moore's ABC characters. And so you've got the original thing to follow. It's like a template. Um, so you know what those characters are going to do or say in any particular situation. Um, it's like, um, you know, and the bigger the character, uh, the easier it is because, you know, you know how to write a Sherlock Holmes story. Everybody does. You know how to write a Batman story. Everybody does. Um, so all you do is you just follow the template that's been established. I think what's harder, and it put me off having a go at it for years and years, is doing your own thing, because then you don't have any template to follow. You're making it up literally as you go along. 
Um, and you're finding out what that character thinks and would do. Um, if I'd known it would work out as well, so, you know, Resident Alien was really the first major thing I'd done like that. And if I'd known it would work out as well as it did, then I would have done it years before. <laughs> but there you go. But so in, in addition to that kind of process, though, I mean, what do you how do you work with an artist? Like, what is the collaboration process like? Like, for example, with with Michael Zuli or Steve Parkhouse? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's. Um, well, I learned a lot of stuff from Alan Moore and, and uh, you know, one of the things that um, he did when he was uh, right from the start was he would. Uh, make his scripts very descriptive and it was partly because you didn't know who was going to draw it you know they'd, they'd team you up with an artist about whom you maybe had no idea so you put as much stuff into the script as possible to give that information to the artist so that they can then um, you know interpret it in their own way it doesn't mean to say they have to follow everything but you putting it in there gives them the possibility of that or the, the ability to choose stuff um so th there's always been a degree of that I mean, with some people like michael and uh, steve um uh i mean i never met michael but we talked over the phone quite a bit um and uh, and steve the same he's at the other end of the country so i don't get to meet up with him very often but we talk on the phone we email and other than that, my scripts are like this sort of incredibly long letter to the artist. Um, with somebody like Steve, we've been working together for so long now that it kind of comes down to a shorthand where we by and large trust each other to get on with it. And every once in a while, Steve will say, you know, I'm tired of drawing offices. Can we please go outside for a scene or two, draw some nature? Um, so you know it's um uh, it's a sort of to and fro kind of thing but it, but it, the trust has to be there i think i mean you know somebody like steve or zuli you know i know they're good artists i know they're they're really capable of you know if i just say say you know okay over to you for a couple of pages do what you want to do and i'll work around you then i know it'll turn out okay yeah Talking about uh, following Neil Gaiman, what's it like to follow Alan Moore on uh, the ABC stuff? Well, the thing is, Alan asked me to come and, you know, write for it. Um, Does that add pressure or alleviate pressure? Both. Oh, both. I mean, yeah, I mean, um, well, it's one of those things of, you know, it's like being given a, you know, a very delicate piece of you know uh antiques or glassware or something and the guy goes polish this and don't break it <laughs> you know, that's what it's like um so uh what happened really was i he asked me to come in and do something for abc and i did the tesla strong special which had about half a dozen really good artists it's really and, good yeah it was really good fun to do and um and after that, it was like sort of, you know, um, he wanted me to do more and uh, the publishers were very nervous about, basically they wanted Alan to write everything and he was kind of, you know, buckling under the strain of it all. So he wanted to sort of hand off some stuff. And I suggested doing the, something with the Terror Obscura characters. <clears throat> so we reached this kind of compromise with the publishers whereby Alan and I co-plotted it and then i'd go away and write the scripts and we did two series of that and i did a few issues of uh, tom strong and a, and a couple of other fill-in type things and uh, and then abc just kind of fizzled out and came to an end because alan had just kind of like finished his bit and they weren't really um interested in doing anything more with it which struck me as odd at the time but it's really uh, weird right it is really weird and so then i didn't um uh it was a couple of years after that and somebody had written a, an interesting article about abc and i i rang up ben amanati and said you know hey you should read this thing 
and that got us talking again and i said well how about me doing some you know um some more terror obscura just me and he went away and thought about it for a day and he said well actually what we'd really be interested in doing is for you to do some tom strong um but obviously alan would have to be okay with the idea and i went yeah of course i can see that and i rang up alan and alan was fine with the idea of me doing some more so we did some more and we did two more series and again i'd happily done more but with terror um, obscura being in it in the, in the second well, I did one. one i did one called the uh, tom strong and the robots of doom um which again you can probably get digitally but i think the book's out of print um and that was kind of a time travel um you know tom fights nazis kind of deal yeah uh, and then for the second one i brought back the terror obscure people because because i wanted to and it was the only way i could use them so this is uh this is fascinating to me you know you talking about how dc's never wanted to do anything more with the abc stuff because i mean anecdotally the gateway comic that i lend the most to my friends that works the most is yeah. top 10 because right. it, okay. because they say that it's the comic that teaches them that they have to look at the pictures yes and yes I'm like, if that can have an effect, even even anecdotally, which I understand is not, uh, you know, representative of the whole population, but still, if that can have that kind of effect, and then mm -hmm. there's this variety of characters in this line, why is this company just sitting on it? And that's something well, that I've never understood. Well, I think, hmm, no, nor do I really. I mean, I think the, I think part of it is that, um, Everything worked fine until um, till Alan stopped writing for them. And at that point, you know, things that upset Alan kind of geared up. You know, they started to do the Watchmen spin-offs and, you know, and all the rest of it. And so the relationship and then, you know, um, uh, when Paul, I think Paul Levitz did actually take care not to annoy alan um yeah but the people the people that followed him really didn't care and they just went ahead and annoyed him and so at that point i mean i'd been begging them to let me do more tom strong and they wouldn't and then it reached a point was even if they'd said yes or even if they'd asked me i couldn't have done it because of the way they were they were treating alan oh wow so i mean i, I would have loved to have done another couple of tom uh, stories and I and I had ideas and all the rest of it, but it reached a point when now it could never happen. I'm fascinated by the many worlds of Tesla Strong that you mentioned yeah. because uh, you wrote it with a plot assist from Alan. There are the following artists: Chris Sprouse and Carl Story, Michael Golden, Adam Hughes, Phil Noto, Arthur Adams, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, which is Frank yes, Cho, sir. J. Scott <laughs> Campbell, Claudio Castellini, Jason Pearson. Um, that's amazing did you end yes. up writing each scene suited for each artist uh no not really i mean well first of all the plot assist from alan i think that was just alan saying you know don't do this do that uh, and that was it but they wanted to put his name on the cover so there you go um in terms of the artist uh basically uh, I mean, some of those guys I didn't even know, but what I did know was that I wanted uh, the ingredients that I used. So I wanted, you know, this kind of Tesla and that kind of Tesla and, you know, and the whole story had to flow from one to the other. So all of that, um, um, all of that was basically down to me. And then Scott Doonbeer would match up the artists that you know he'd lined up and scott was always great at line you know getting fantastic artists yeah so he would then sort of assign them the relevant scene um i remember there was this one thing where he he wanted to do um uh something um 
that rather than had the have the Aztec scene, he wanted to have a kind of Galactus and the Silver Surfer type thing. And I just said, why don't we do both? We'll have a gigantic Aztec Galactus and Silver Surfer type thing, which was Tesla on the board, but you know, yeah. Uh, but everybody knows what was going on. Um, so it was a bit of a kind of a you know, to and fro thing and mix and match. And um, if I remember rightly, I think Jason did an enormous number of pages, you know, which, you know, which were great, but I mean, he was very much kind of, you know, uh, I think Scott had run out of other artists by that point. So he was kind of, <laughs> he was, he closed the book. That's true. Yes. Yeah. So you mentioned that you write a very detailed full script, but then I yeah. look at that book and then I think that those Jose Luis Garcia Lopez pages are very clearly Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. It, does yeah, a bunch yeah. of things that he does bring their own style to it okay but yeah yeah um, and i mean and i you know i i do what you know um any sensible writer would do which is to sort of say you know here's what i think but if you can see a better way of doing it do it you know yeah i mean you got jose luis garcia lopez drawing your book why don't you know yeah which i didn't even know at the time uh but uh yeah yeah that was great yeah, the three issues of Tom Strong that you did, straight up. Um, you were very, very invested in the story of Dr. Permafrost. Yes, and I brought him back for the... Um, um, uh, for um, Planet Story. of the Peril, yeah. No, the one before. Uh, the oh, Robots, Robots of, of Doom. Doom, yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, I don't really know why. It's, but very often with characters, you kind of bring them on stage and then they... Um, they have their own ideas or you see a side of them that you hadn't previously seen. And he was one of those. And in fact, there was an occasion in that I'd written this line uh, for him. And I had a dream in which he was going, I wouldn't have said that, you know, how can you think that this thing would matter to me? You know, what matters to me is my kid. And I went, Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and so I changed the script, you know, did you, you you were the you were the last one to write the regular issue of Tom Strong before um, before Alan ended it with yeah. number thirty six. How did you feel when it came to an end and supposedly the whole ABC universe came to an end? I felt sad. I mean, you know, there'd been this kind of sort of uh, you know slight possibility of it carrying on without Alan, and they did the the um, that sort of A to Z, you know. Yeah. Um, mini series and which never got finished but why would they even contemplate doing that if they weren't going to carry on i mean that i think the whole point of that was that it, it was like sort of new readers start here and it would be a spring springboard for other stuff but it didn't work out that way i i think what alan achieved with the abc line was extraordinary um, I don't think it got the readership that it deserved, but I think it's going to be one of those things that's talked about in 50 years time, you know, and the variety of it as well. I mean, not just the fact of, um, uh, you know, Tom Strong or top 10, but Promethea, which is wow, you know, that's something completely different. I mean, it's a whole other league. Um, but if you take the whole thing as a, as, as a, as a whole, and the fact that he did all that in that time period, um, that's astonishing. You know, it really is. It is my absolute favorite imprint of all time. And Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, well, yeah, I'll go along with that. With, no, I felt, I felt deeply honored to be a part of it because there weren't that many of us. You know, I, I, yeah. on the writing side, there was just Alan, me, Rick Veach. Um, I think Leia Moore did a few things. Yes. Um, Steve Moore, and that's it. Yeah, and on the on the artist side, it's a it's an all star cast. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's a, uh, Scott Dunbeer knows this. I told him this. Like my one of the holy grails that I would want is to get everybody who would do it to get on one big interview about a ABC, <laughs> 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 because I think that would be so fun. Because I think I really do think you're right. I don't think it got the readership that it deserved. And it's not talked about enough. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's one of the things. It's that kind of tragedy about the um, 
the superhero universe is that um you know to some extent I mean, you know the publishers to some extent think it's the characters that matter more than the creators they can't tell the difference between uh, a superman story by alan moore and a superman story by joe schmo you know and that's that's the tragedy and the bigger tragedy is that to some extent the readers have proved them right um in that uh you know here's alan moore doing these amazing comics and not that many people noticed yeah um there is a faction of fandom that will buy a particular character just because it's that particular character i know i know well yeah. you, i can kind of understand you know having an emotional attachment to characters but you know nonetheless i know the difference between a good superman story and a bad one and i'm not going to read the bad ones <laughs> one of the one of the things i've always wondered about is that i think it was pretty clear in the mid 80s that alan clearly wanted to write an ongoing superman book and why did yeah. dc never you know say hey you get to write superman for more than two issues well i think they already had john byrne set up and they thought that was going to last for you know a good long while and the, the reason that alan um did those two issues was because you know john byrne was going like right i'm going to rip up you know clean slate start from start again from the beginning and i'm not going to use all this silly stuff and alan was like the silly stuff works fine and i will prove it to you and, you know, and he did <laughs> Um, but I think then things started to go wrong quite quickly um, with Watchmen because, um, uh, you know, they did sort of merchandising, they did, you know, buttons and T-shirts and all the rest of it. Role playing game. And then they, they kind of made out that it wasn't merchandising. This was promotional stuff. And Alan just went, well, you're liars and thieves, you know. <laughs> and his his kind of um, whatever warmth he felt for them began to kind of dissipate then, I think. Alan has a reputation on the internet, and I think it's exacerbated by the fact that he's not on the internet. Uh, yeah. What What is he like as a person? he's well i love him you know he's one of the nicest sweetest people i've ever met uh and one of the most intelligent but you know he can he can be a grumpy sod especially if people are kind of like poking him with a stick you know he'll respond like a grumpy sod as most of us would you know yeah. and that's he then he gets that reputation you know i mean i think the thing is um you know, for a long time, it's been evident that he doesn't want to talk about Watchmen or superheroes or anything like that. And people keep asking him. So, you know, yeah. he's going to respond according to type. You know, you ask him about something else. It's like, you know, I um, I had about five or six meetings with Van Morrison over the years, trying to persuade him to do a book or let somebody write an autobiography, write a biography or whatever, or he could write a novel or you know, just anything along those things. And the thing about Van Morrison is he has this reputation about being difficult. And that's because people ask him about his music and he doesn't want to talk about his music, you know, but if you talk to him about literature or movies or art or somebody else's music, uh, you'll, you'll get a very different response. Exactly. They, yeah, because yeah. like I think somebody was talking to me uh, earlier this year about the possibility of getting Alan on my show, and I said it would never happen. And then he said that, um, well, if you do, you have to ask him about Watchmen. And I said, why would I ask him about something that he's been asked a billion times? Yeah. And I don't understand, yeah, I because if you get an hour with Alan Moore and all you can think of talking about is Watchmen, I don't know. <laughs> maybe do, maybe ask him about something else. Yeah, yeah. I think the thing is, is that um, I think he's now very firmly turned his back on comics, you know, so even if you asked him about, I don't know, big numbers or from hell or whatever, and it was all not superhero stuff, he might not want to do it, you know. Yeah, I, I've been told several times, <laughs> so, <I've, laughs> so yeah. I won't try. Um, but his gripe, I mean, you know, thing about alan is alan loves comics that's part of the problem uh, yes it's the, it's the comics industry that he felt had kind of um 
screwed everything up, you know. And it's certainly that was something that he wanted no no part of. And he clearly still loves superheroes, right? Oh, like, God, yeah, yeah. The whole idea. I, I, I told him. Well, I mean, I I used to go up to Northampton quite often when we were working on the ABC stuff. And there was one time I done it um just after a con and i went oh i saw this thing i saw a superman comic up on the wall and it was you know i didn't have any cash i had to go and get some cash and come back and i'm like hold that for me you know and uh, i came back and it was, you know it was silver age comic about 1962 63 and uh, so i started came back and I got the the money and bought the comic and all the rest of it. And so I'm telling the story to Alan and Alan's eyes just lit up and he went, which issue, which issue was it? You know? And uh, no, he very much loves this stuff. And um, I think the tragedy for him is that it's in the hands of people who aren't worthy is probably how he sees it. Yeah. Understood. You mentioned earlier the differences between writing for a, a, a character somebody else owns or has created versus a character that uh, you created yourself. Uh, what about something that kind of falls in the middle, like very poorly defined golden age heroes from the 1940s who all of a sudden are now in their own book? So I'm talking about Terra Obscura. Yeah, well, the thing was, I vaguely remembered those characters from some kind of 1960s revival of them. Um, but as with a lot of kind of uh, classic, well, as with Marvel Man, Miracle Man, um, you know, Alan could take something that was like really shallow and just make you love it, you know, because he would give it depth and meaning and all the rest of it. So when he did those, use those Terror Obscura characters in uh, Tom Strong, I just thought, you know, they're, they're, this is fantastic. There's you know, there's stuff here that could really be expanded further. These these characters, you know, are interesting and they've got depth and all the rest of it. So that's why I suggested doing something with it. Um, but doing that, um, well, again, I can't. I think really, I mean, you know, what I was following. I mean, I've read a lot of the 1940s stuff as a result of that. And like most golden age things, it's kind of unreadable. Uh, you know, it's not much. <laughs> Well, there's not much in the Golden yeah. Age that stands up. You know, there's the spirit and, you know, maybe Plastic Man and all the rest of it. But for everything else, it's kind of um, uh, the reason you love those characters, the reason you love Dr. Fate or, you know, Namor or any of those things is because of the 60s versions, you know, because mm. the 1940s versions aren't that great. Um, so it was the kind of the same with, with Terror Obscura. I was kind of, you know, I was following Alan's template rather than the 1940s template and developing that um, in conjunction with Alan. Do you have a favorite Terra Obscura character? <laughs> you know, I kind of love them all. <laughs> um, No, I really do. Just thinking about but, it, I, I, you know, if I had to save one of them from a burning building, I just uh, the hell with it. I'll go in the burning building myself, and we'll all go together. <laughs> so this is a this is a question I'm just curious about, and this has nothing to do with writing. But the, there, is there anything? Is there any challenge corporate wise when working on public domain characters? Like, is is it a case where maybe DC's like, well, we can't merchandise this because they're public domain characters; we can't trademark them. Like, does that get does that kind of thing get in the way? I, to be honest, I've got no idea. Oh, okay. um, I think the the problem, I mean, basically, the minute we stop using the 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 Nador characters, then um, you know, up pups other people to do it, and you know, do their version of the Black Terror and all the rest of it. Um, whether or not they would have done so if we were still doing our version i don't know would have made life difficult yeah for everybody probably are you surprised in any way that the black terror seems to be the one that most people um you know latch on to uh 
not really. I mean, he's you know, in our version, he was kind of extreme. I, I kind of liked our version, uh, the yeah. kind of well, it was Alan's version, really. The idea of doing a sort of you, you, you know, did, you did make him more extreme than Alan's starting point, though. Yeah, we probably did. That was probably me <laughs> <laughs> just wanting to. Yeah, uh, can you talk to me about how Resident Alien uh germinated and got fully formed? Um, yeah, it was one of those things. I wasn't, uh, it, ABC had come to an end and, uh, and it was just sort of trying, casting around, trying to find somebody that would employ me because, you know, the big two didn't appear to be interested. Um, so, uh, that really meant doing something of my own and I decided to do it in conjunction with Steve, uh, Parkhouse. So, uh, I rang him up and said, you know, look, let's team up and try and, you know, get a deal for something. What do you want to work on? And um, he wanted to do something involving aliens. So I went away and thought about it and came up with the sort of very rough outline of, um, of what Resident Alien became. Um, and we shunted that into, you know, four or five publishers. And the only one that responded was Dark Horse, who got them back onto me immediately and said yeah um and i think the reason that they did so was was um they saw what i saw which was this this might have um possibilities in another dimension as a tv show or a movie so and that's i think really probably why they backed it and backed it for well it took 10 years for the the tv show to happen so um, um and in that time um we kind of got the chance to um, let Resident Alien develop and grow into, you know, what it ultimately became. And Did, I should say is is still becoming because I'm still writing it. So for for those not in the know, what is the what is the quick synopsis for Resident Alien? OK, quick synopsis for Resident Alien is there is an alien who has crash landed on Earth. Um, some years previously and is um, keeping a low profile, trying to avoid humanity and just praying that a rescue ship will turn up one day and come and get him. And he has the ability, I mean, we show him as an alien throughout, but it's obvious that all the people around him see him as a normal human being. So he's affecting their sensibility somehow, mm -hmm. hypnotizing, whatever. Um, and he's been he's adopted the idea of a small town doctor and one day the small town sheriff comes to get him because they need a doctor and the rest of it kind of grows from there and he uh, he kind of takes to operating as a kind of amateur detective simply to keep himself sane you know just to have a puzzle to work on Resident Alien is a great title. Uh, did that yeah. come before or after you formulated the idea? Did you know the story? I know, know the how the I know how the title came to be. I just don't know if it came before or after. Right. No, it came. Well, it. Uh, I remembered it when 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 I started work on this thing. I remembered that I had this title lurking in the back of my mind. It came from there was a guy called Mick Farron who was. Um, he was a rock musician and a rock journalist and a science fiction novelist and all kinds of other things. Anyway, he English guy, friend of mine living in New York. And one time when I was in New York, I went to see him and I said he was married to an American woman. So I sort of said, you know, is that how come you get to stay here? It's like, you know, you've got a green card. And he went, no, I've got a green card. I've got one of these things. And he pulled out a resident alien card. And I just looked at it and I burst out laughing. And he went, yeah, I know. Because <laughs> we both pictured what i would end up doing yeah and then uh so i think that's one of the differences right between that's one of the things writers do is like you store that in your in your memory banks for yeah for later yeah on. i mean it's fact it's, it's i was thinking about this the other day about alan because he it's a it's a thing that he does which is that if i were to sort of stumble across something you know like uh Oh, I don't know, dream of something or something in the real world where I go, that's that's a great idea. I'll put that to one side. And I would like make a note of it and 
maybe a month, maybe a year, maybe never, I'd get around to using it. With Alan, he'll use it that day. He'll just put it into whatever he's working on at the moment. I've wow. seen him do it. It's kind of astonishing. <laughs> he doesn't think of like saving it for something bigger or? No, no. Oh, wow. It's, uh, and it's also, uh, you know, I mean, there were things where he would, you know, when I was going out to Northampton a lot and he would say, um, oh, I had this weird experience or I had this weird dream and and tell me about it in, in some detail. And then three months later, whatever, I would read it in the pages of Promethea. He did, he just stuck it into a Promethea story. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, so Resident Alien is a series of mini series. That's and, right. Uh, is there a particular reason for that format? It was, uh, well, I think initially it was like, um, well, initially they, they commissioned um, 24 pages, three sort of eight page chunks for Dark Horse Presents. And initially we thought that might be all we'd get. And so sort of then it was like sort of, okay, you can do a mini series and the rest of it. And then the next year it was like, yes, you know, where we, we still think, you know, the TV show might happen. So yes, we're commissioning a second mini series. And so it went on year after year, but it actually worked out very well because um, uh, if we had, if we tried to do it as a monthly, it would have just fallen to bits because, you know, Steve isn't that fast. I'm not that fast. So, but the fact that we were just doing, you know, a mini series a year or thereabouts meant that we could, uh, you know, put our all into it. And um, I mean, I probably spent twice as long writing Resident Alien as I have done writing anything else, but I think it shows. I think the quality shows. Is that also because, uh, you know, you're making these characters up from scratch and you're just getting to know them? Yeah, partly. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's it's all, it, and it kind of coincided with um, uh, the fact that I was uh, looking after small kids when we started doing this thing. So, so my time was kind of limited. Um, so that might have been a factor as well. How did the uh, the idea of it potentially becoming a TV show, and now that it has become a TV show, it premiered uh, during the pandemic. Um, yeah. Now that it has become a TV show, how did that in any way, if at all, affect the way that you wrote the comic? I th well, first of all, the TV show is very different from the comic, and um, and Chris Sheridan, who's the showrunner, has kind of taken it uh, off in a whole load of different directions. So there's not that. So it's not that faithful. There's not that much common ground. Um, but it is. You know, it is really good in its own right, and I enjoy it as much as anybody else. Um, I think the I found um, the it was it was kind of weird um, putting the TV show out of my head completely, which I tried to do when I was actually writing. You know, the next one of mine. Um, and but it, but it's been as, as positive a thing as it as it has um anything else because um uh, because a lot of the time i think you know well they're doing they're going left so i can go right i can do this whole other thing you know um so the relationship between the two it's, it's a little hard to define mm -hmm. but before the tv show existed did you feel the need to make it look like you know something that a network executive could easily pick up or or was that not even no, a consideration? The thing, well, to get the deal, we did like half a dozen pages, and um, which was actually the opening of the the comic, and you know, and ultimately became the opening of the TV show as well. And um, and when I was writing that, um, I thought this is really weird. This feels like a TV show, and nothing I'd ever written before, you know, had that aspect to it. Um, so so that was kind of there from the start and i think that's what mike richardson saw as well um but beyond that did i try and cater anything for uh, a tv show not really with each mini series i did try to kind of expand the supporting cast 
um, just to sort of open up the possibilities. And, you know, and having done that thing of sort of, you know, alien investigating a murder and, you know, and so the next time we make the murder slightly different, but it's the same kind of formula. After about three books, I thought, you know, we need to expand this. And then the next thing that happened was, well, we've had these running threads for about four or five books now. I need to kind of progress them or, uh, you know, uh, bring them to an end or something. So it all became more complex as it went along. But it was, but it happened very organically. Looking back, uh, how do you feel about uh, making your own stuff? versus writing other people's characters you wish you'd done it sooner i do but i think the uh the the thing about i think again this is something i've, I've probably acquired from alan and from neil is that if you do if you're honest about this stuff and you put you know you, know, you put your all into it then each thing you do becomes the hardest thing you've ever done. It's a bit like climbing a cliff. And with each one, you learn something. And then, you know, and then you go on to the next one. And, and that's the most hard, hardest thing you've ever done. So all the things I did before kind of, um, you know, added to the mix. And I couldn't have done Resident Alien without them. So, you know. Okay. So in a way, my question cycles back to not really having that much of a point <laughs> <laughs> well that's your problem <laughs> uh congratulations on the success of resident alien um and uh, i hope the the tv show even though it hasn't really been faithful uh is doing is doing well um do you wish it had been more faithful or is that not even something well, you think about no it's 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 something i get asked a lot um my feeling really is um it's kind of uh, if they'd done a really faithful show but it was kind of low budget and dull uh that would have been awful you know the fact that they've done something that is being enjoyed by millions of people and it's actually good um and you know my friends watch it and like it you know all of that um it's it's absolutely fine with me i'd far rather we had that than the dull version yeah i think i asked that right now because um when i was watching the sandman netflix show i was yeah. thinking to myself i've never seen a comic book show be this faithful yeah to the source material and i guess i'm just not surprised when when a comic book show isn't at this point well, I think that's what the 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 fact that TV now is a very different kind of animal to what it was ten or twenty years ago means that this stuff is possible, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it didn't used to be. I mean, the reason you've got a decent version of Sandman now is because, but basically, you know, uh, Neil said no to all the bad <laughs> version, <laughs> and it's and basically was, ten movies. Yeah, 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 yeah uh what would what would 2022 peter hogan say to 1978 peter hogan to 1978 peter. oh i don't know um probably relax it'll all turn out okay you know but that's Very part of what that's part of what life teaches us anyway you know just in general yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. This has been an awesome interview. And to top it all off, uh, I just wanted to ask you, what is next? What is next? Well, I've just finished book seven of Resident Alien comes out uh, next or starts coming out next week. Um, I've just finished writing the scripts for book eight and. Uh, and I'm book nine will probably be the last one but i'm taking a bit of a break um before i do that and right this minute i'm i'm writing um short uh short horror comic stories for a kind of um compilation uh which will be 
um, all of my stuff with you know half a dozen artists uh, and that will probably be you know um, kickstarted or something like that sometime in the next year That was going to be my last question, but now I'm going to ask this. What do you think Kickstarter has done for the comics industry? I don't really know. I'm, I'm kind of curious to find out for myself. Um, but um, but it's a way of doing things that might not otherwise happen. So there's that. Yeah. Do you think it... Um Because uh, you were around for the for what is called the golden age of self-publishing. Right. Um, in, in the 80s to early 90s. Uh, do you think we're in for another one of those things just because of crowdfunding? It may be. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think the thing is, I was thinking about this this recently, and I was thinking about the fact that, um, you know, a century ago, comics were so much more diverse than they are now. You know, you had Crazy Cat and Little Nemo and The Phantom and Little Orphan Annie and... You know, it just goes on and on and on. Yeah. And then, if you think about the 1960s, it wasn't just the big two. It was uh, it was Gold Key and Dell and Classics Illustrated and Archie and you know, again, quite a range of stuff. Um, Classics Illustrated. Um, and I was thinking about the last time we had kind of, I mean, with the exception of Dark Horse, who are kind of pretty much carrying the torch on their own these days in terms of. Uh, you know, major publishers. If we leave Image aside, because Image is kind of a you know, thing all of its own. Um, but Vertigo, Vertigo was the last, you know, thing where it was really offering an alternative, you know, because they did crime stories, they did fantasy, mm -hmm. they did science fiction, they did war stories, you know, and we need something like that. We really do. But where it's going to come from, I have no idea. Understood. Thank you so much. This has been an awesome conversation. <laughs> okay. See you around. Thank you.